In parts A and B of the question, we are asked to determine the magnitude and direction of the net magnetic field at the center of the loops. And before we make a calculation, we want to make sure we understand the direction of the two magnetic fields that are produced by these current carrying loops. We've drawn each loop down here below, the larger loop on the left and the smaller one on the right. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to grasp each loop with our right hand. Now, when you grasp a loop with your right hand, what you want to do is make sure that your thumb is pointing in the same direction as the current. So for the larger loop, the current was traveling in this kind of clockwise direction, as indicated in this drawing, as also indicated in the original picture. So your thumb should be pointing clockwise, because that's the direction of the current. And then look where your fingers are naturally curling as you grasp the wire. They're curling into the loop, into the computer screen, if you will. So that means that at the center of the loop, because your fingers are curling into the screen, the magnetic field will also be pointing into the screen. The fingers, in other words, show the direction of the magnetic field. So for the first loop, we can say that the magnetic field, B1, will be pointing into the screen. On the other hand, pun intended, we have drawn a right hand grasping the smaller loop, and this time the thumb needs to be curling or pointing in a counterclockwise direction because current I2 is going in a counterclockwise direction. In this case, then, your fingers will be naturally curling out of the loop or out of the computer screen. This is kind of a rough, very crude picture, but hopefully we can see that as our thumb points in a counterclockwise direction, our fingers will be curling out of the screen. And again, that means the magnetic field will be pointing out of the screen. So this means that B2 will be pointing out of the screen. Now, typically, out of the screen is assigned a positive value, and into the screen is assigned a negative value. So this means that our B2 will be positive and our B1 will be negative. With those ideas in mind, we next want to calculate the magnitude of each magnetic field. And we do that by obeying this equation over here. We take the number of loops within the circular wire, we multiply it by a constant and the current, and then divide by 2r. Now r is basically just going to be, in this case, the radius of the loop. Now it's important to understand that for both loops, there's only one loop within each wire. So they're just single loop circular wires. That will mean that our n value will equal 1 for each. So basically we can disregard this n in this particular case. Let's go ahead and calculate b1 by taking that constant mu naught, multiplying it by current i1, and then dividing it by 2 times the radius of wire 1. Let's fill in the known values. So here is the setup, a couple of things to note. The value of mu naught, which is that constant, is written right here. This is right out of your textbook. The current I1 was given as 5 amps, and then the radius of the first larger loop, R1, was 12 centimeters. However, we had to convert that into meters. So notice we multiplied the 12 by 10 to the negative 2 in order to convert it into meters. So we pick up our calculators here, and we can see that the magnitude of B1 is 2.62 times 10 to the minus 5. The unit here will be Tesla for the magnetic field. And remember that B1, we said, was pointing into the page, and therefore it is negative. So we have to remember that if we're going to assign both a magnitude and a direction, that we put a negative sign on B1. So this is so far so good. We need to do the same thing with B2. So let's plug in the known values down here. We're going to have the constant times I2 divided by 2 times R2. Okay, so again, take note of how we filled in the values. We have the constant we multiplied by I2, which was given to be 3 amps, and then the radius of that smaller loop, because it was in centimeters, 9 centimeters, we converted that into meters by multiplying by 10 to the minus 2. B2 will turn out to be about 2.09 times 10 to the minus 5. This again will be in Tesla. Remember, B2 was out of the page, so it will be positive. So we're going to keep that as a positive vectors to indicate out of the page. Now, the net magnetic field will simply be the sum of these two. Just keep in mind that B1 was negative. So we're going to take the negative 2.62 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla and then add that 
to the 2.09 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. When you do that, you should get about negative 5.24 times 10 to the minus 6 Tesla. Now, the fact that our answer was negative means that the overall net magnetic field will be pointing into the page. That's an important thing to understand. That's actually the answer to part B, is that the net magnetic field will be into the page. But then for part A, the magnitude of the net magnetic field will just be the 5.24 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla. If you need to convert that into micro Tesla, then you simply say that one micro Tesla is 10 to the minus 6 Tesla. Setting it up in this manner cancels out the Tesla. It actually cancels out the 10 to the negative sixths here. And so you should be left with a final answer of 5.24 micro Tesla as the magnitude for part A. So let's take a look at part C. It says, let R1 remain fixed at 12 centimeters and let R2 be variable. Determine the value of R2 such that the net magnetic field at the center of the loop is zero. So in this case, it looks like R2, which is the radius of the smaller loop, can be sort of flexible. We can either shrink its size or expand its size. But what we definitely want to make sure is that the net field is zero. So what does this mean when the net field is zero? Well, it will certainly mean that the magnitude of magnetic field one equals the magnitude of magnetic field two. And that way they would cancel each other out. Remember the equation for the magnetic field is mu i over two r. So if we came down here for b1, we could say mu times i1 over two times r1 equals mu times i2 divided by two times r2. We can actually divide both sides of the equation by mu, so they would cancel out. We can actually multiply both sides of the equation by two, so that the twos cancel out. So the equation greatly simplifies. We now have i1 over r1 is equal to i2 over r2. Recall the question is asking us to find r2. So why don't we go ahead and try to solve this for r2. We can do so by first multiplying both sides of the equation by r2. So the R2s cancel out here. We then have R2 times I1 over R1 is equal to I2. And then to finish solving for R2, what I think is best is to multiply both sides by R1 over I1. R1 over I1. This way the R1s on the left side cancel as do the I1s. So finally we have R2 is equal to I2 times R1 divided by I1. We simply plug in the known values now. Remember that I2 was 3 amps. The radius of the larger loop, R1, was fixed at 12 centimeters. And then the current flowing through the larger loop was 5 amps. So we punch this in and we should get 7.2. And then the amps would cancel we have centimeters as our final unit here. So this would be the correct answer to part C.